I'd like to just spend a few minutes really talking about why resilience and what is the dividend. The idea is really premised on the evidence that crisis may be becoming the new normal. That there isn't a week that goes by that somewhere in the world we don't see something that people would define as a crisis, a cyber attack, a new form of virus, a terrorist attack, a severe weather event, and that we as a global community have been spending billions in a paradigm that is predicated on disaster recovery and repair rather than one that is based on readiness, preparedness, prevention. We can't prevent every disruption we can't predict every disruption, but we can build a resilient capacity that enables us to prevent every disruption from becoming a disaster. These investments not only pay off in how effectively we recover after a crisis hits, or how we recover from the slow burning stresses, which this also addresses, that impair the capacity of an entity to be resilient, slow burning stresses like inequality and poverty and the like. And so how we prepare and get ready for our systems, ourselves as individuals, our cities, our society, our businesses or institutions, really determines our capacity to respond more quickly and more effectively, and to be able to adapt and grow in the face of stress, to revitalize, to not just build back, whether it's a city or a system or an institution, the way it was before, because that's the element of the vulnerabilities that made us exposed in the first place. So how do we use the crisis or the stressor as an opportunity to rebuild in a way that's more adaptive, revitalize more effectively? The dividend is that these investments are not only protective in the bad times, but yield multiple gains for the investments in the good times. Different kinds of jobs, goods and services, new kinds of facilities, new kinds of opportunities. That's critical in a time of economic downturns, a time when we all, as citizens, governments, leaders, are making decisions about how to spend, and you can get more wins for any single investment by framing your investment decisions through a resilience building lens, and that's the dividend. How do we frame policy in such a way that deals with this issue of resilience? Well, I think that's a wonderful statement because often policy is made looking in the rearview mirror. So the planning is always, not always, but often responsive to the last thing that happened. And the argument about building resilience is that in preparing more generally for any type of disruption, you can be more responsive specifically to whatever happens. So we can't frame policies based on yesterday's crisis. The goal here is to be able to build greater capacity for those things that are somewhat predictable. So if I am planning for uh, San Francisco, I know that I'm at high seismic risk. So clearly, I don't know when it will happen, but I imagine it will, and therefore I'm fortifying both physical infrastructure, soft infrastructure, and indeed social infrastructure, which is a deep part of the capacity of resilience against that risk. But I need to do that, build those capacities and that strength in a way that also fortifies me against other kinds of risks. And so whether it's inequality or mudslides or droughts, there are capacities that can be built in, even if seismic is in your mindset, that make you able to respond better to any disruption. We know we're living in this increasingly complex, local, upside down, uh, informal world. I think I heard a figure the other day that uh, by the time we hit that 2050 mark, I think 60 to 70 percent of the world will be in the informal sector. Yet our instruments tend to be quite static instruments. Our planning policies, they tend to be about command and control and complex rules and quite deterministic kind of practices. How do we change mindsets amongst professionals to think differently about how we control the complexity of cities? The Rockefeller Foundation works extensively in the developing world and so we have a considerable amount of experience in seeing 
both the benefits of the informal economies and also clearly the downside. And so much of our system now is predicated on policies for a certain narrative around who is the working population and where do they live and how do they govern themselves or how should they be governed. And as these informal workers, and by the way, I think in the developed world, as we see more independent workers, yeah. workers who are not aligned to a particular company or a particular industry, we'll see a convergence of policies that make a greater similarity drawn between the creative mm. class, the mm. independent contractor, and the informal sector that we're beginning to see very interesting policy work around. And it is emerging from developing world thinking.